رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل لعقدة من لساني يفقه قولي. We begin in the name of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, the Exalted, the Sublime, the King of Kings and the Creator of all things, and we pray to Him that He sends His choicest blessings and mercy upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and his wives and his family members and his companions and all those who follow their footsteps until the day of judgment, asking Him to include us amongst them out of His mercy and His compassion. Allahumma amin. So. We're doing, what are we doing today? What are we discussing? Uh, that, that makes it easy, right? <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> Next. So, before we begin with the actual, if we can do the next slide, please. Before we begin with the actual um, tafsir of the surah, I wanted to bring our attention to this hadith here that the Prophet ﷺ taught us. And it's narrated by Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, where he says the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ said, there are no people. There's never a group of people that gather together in the house out of the houses of Allah, the masjid, any masjid, anybody in any masjid, any group in any masjid. And their purpose in gathering is to read the book of Allah or, you know, recite it or to study it amongst themselves. Except that tranquility will descend upon them. Do you guys feel it? Do you feel tranquil right now? Anyone stressed out? Now, now the person who's not feeling is like, okay, what, what do I do now? But inshallah, you'll feel it by the end, right? The, the, the effects of the verses of the Quran will do that if you don't feel it already. I feel it, alhamdulillah, coming to the masjid. Reading, praying together, reading our namaz together, starting a look into the book of Allah together, I feel it already, alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from all of us and make it a recurring blessing between us where we are reciting the book of Allah together, uh, praying with it and understanding. Allahumma ameen. But anyway, he's saying, sallallahu alayhi wa that this never happens except something else must happen. It's a cause and effect. The cause is the people, any people, coming to any masjid, reading the book of Allah and trying to understand it. What is the effect? What will happen? He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the angels descend upon them. There's angels here right now, sitting amongst us. And mercy will encompass them. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala encompass, encompasses them in His mercy. So we pray that this is happening right now and our sins are being forgiven. Allahumma ameen. And finally, the angels surround them. Oh, sorry. First, He said the tranquility descends upon them. The mercy encompasses them and the angels descend upon them. These three things. So we pray that this is what's occurring to us now. Allahumma ameen. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He allows this gathering to be such a gathering. And then finally, the ultimate caveat, the ultimate prize is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions them with the gathering in His presence, the angels. Can you imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying your name, saying my name to those angels that are of the highest gathering and saying so and so, Muhammad is in the masjid mentioning or reading Quran. Out of the billions of people that are alive now, the billions upon billions that have existed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is choosing to say these names and everyone else who's doing the same. That's, that's special, right? To, to think of my name being mentioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is something that is a huge blessing, that is undeserved, unearned, and I'm immensely grateful for that. So, you know, if this is the only thing we get, and my whole talk was mumbo jumbo and I'm not able to, you know, I, uh, I'm unable to reach any point to you, then take pride in the fact that at least we're getting this. But I hope that's not the case, right? I hope that I'm going to present something that will be of benefit, inshallah, and that will be of interest. We can go to the next slide, inshallah. So firstly, what is tafsir? Just very quickly, this was actually prepared from something else, so I'm going to be honest, so it's still here, so we're going to go over it. <laughs> but um, tafsir in Arabic, in the Arabic language, means to understand. To explain. Fassara, if something is, you do tafsir of something, you're explaining it, you're making it understandable. That's the word in Arabic as, as it was linguistically, meaning before Islam and just in the language. If you look at it Islamically, meaning the technical def definition that Islam gave it, it is the specific explanation of the Quran, the verses of the Quran. What do they mean? Where were they revealed? What are the rulings behind them? Etc. Etc. Everything that is connected with understanding these verses and their purpose. But if you look in the Quran, for example, you see in Surah Yusuf, they say tafsir al-ahlam, the tafsir of dreams. So here, this is, not, this is the linguistic definition, which means explanation, right? It's not the technical definition, which is unique to the Quran. And tafsir is the source of all knowledge. 
everything that we do goes back to the Quran, even the Sunnah. The Prophet Sallallahu anything that he taught, anything that he preached, anything that he explained regarding acts of worship, it's only connected to the original initial revelation which is from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. There's a couple of different methodologies and this is like a huge science in and of itself. Just very quickly, I mentioned two of them here. One of them is to first do tafsir of the Quran using the Quran. Look at other verses of the Quran to explain verses that need explanation. And the Prophet ﷺ was the first one to do this. Right? There's an instance where Allah subhanahu wa says, Alladina Amanu wa lam yalbisu imanahum bi zulm, ulaika lahumul am. The people who have believed in Allah and no zulm has touched their faith. Zulm means oppression. No zulm, no oppression touches their faith. They are the people who have security and they are those who are guided. So the Sahaba they came to the Prophet ﷺ and they were freaking out. They said, which one of us has committed zero oppression? Someone did some oppression at some point in their life, if at the very least against themselves, right? Sinning is oppressing yourself, right? So we're, we're done for. We can't handle this. This is saying the only people who are secure are the perf people who are perfect, and none of us is perfect. So the Prophet ﷺ told him this is not what it means. If you look in another verse of the Quran, where Luqman is talking to his son, he tells him, In the shirk la dhulman azim. Shirk, associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is of the greatest dhulm. This is the dhulm that is referenced in all this. So he explained the Qur'an using the Qur'an, explained the Qur'an via the Sunnah, or the Arabic language after that, and then finally by personal opinion, personal preference. And this has prerequisites as well. You get the idea. Another methodology here is sacred texts, which kind of puts the Qur'an and Sunnah in one. Then by reason or logic and opinion, then finally uh, indirect tafsir, which is like commentary, reflection, which is not really explanation of the meaning, but more of its you know, seeing it in action. So this is, this is just an intro to tafsir. We can, if you have any questions, you know, um, feel free to shoot them at any time or you can wait for the end as you please. We'll move on to the tafsir of Surah Al-Mulk actually. Any questions regarding tafsir or anything like that that we went over? Kind of gleamed over it just because like I said, if I'm being honest, it was part of a, another presentation that kind of didn't get edited out. So, so anyway, moving on to Surah Al-Mulk itself. So it's the 67th Surah, close to the end in the 29th Juz out of 30. And Al-Mulk translates into sovereignty, kingdom, or dominion. Right, they're kind of all similar meanings. And it's also called Surah Tabarak. So there's two surahs that begin with Tabarak. One of them is Surah Al-Mulk. What's the other surah? Hmm? Furqan. Surah Al-Furqan. Excellent. Zakallah khairan. So for the answer and for the water. So Surah Al-Furqan begins with Tabarak as well. But this surah was given the name Surah Tabarak. So if someone says Surah Tabarak, they're not referencing Al-Furqan even though it begins with the same word. They are referencing Surah Al-Mulk and it is a Meccan revelation that is significant because revelations in Mecca differed than revelations in Medina. There's a lot more, for example, rules revealed in Medina and a lot more stories revealed in Mecca. And that has to do with the phase in which revelation was going through and the trials and the different nature of the conflict and the situations that the Muslims and the Prophet ﷺ got into in each city. Moving on now to the next slide, the themes of the surah, number, slide number four. The themes of the surah are four, mainly. One is the, it's a brief introduction into the Islamic creed in general. So we'll, we'll talk about belief in Allah, it'll talk about the Prophet Sallallahu the hereafter general, you know, uh, believing in these things in general. Next, it speaks about the greatness of Allah and the signs in His creation. And this is a huge chunk of the surah. It's actually maybe 50% or more. So we'll be repeating a lot of things. Number three, it's a wake-up call from heedlessness. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala is specifically addressing people who are heedless, who just walking blindly or people who are not paying attention to the signs around them people who are not paying attention to their own state not using the mind that Allah gave them this is this surah is like an alarm bell Allah subhanahu, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell them wake up you have all this around you you have all this that he has given you why are you just bumping around in the dark still you have this revelation you have the Quran telling you what's wrong and what's right you have your own mind showing you what works and what doesn't why are you still heedless Right? This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressing specifically the kuffar of Mecca, but in general, anyone else who falls under this description. And lastly, resurrection and the hereafter. And if you look at it, all four of these kind of go into each other, right? You know, uh, greatness of Allah is a call to wake up from heedlessness. And part of the greatness of Allah is the resurrection and the hereafter, that He will resurrect. These are all things that you'll find in His names and description. So they all kind of, the themes are all uh, intertwined, inshallah. Next slide, the virtues of the surah. So this surah has a lot of virtues. The Prophet ﷺ, there's quite a number of hadith on it. Some of them are not, you know, the top level of authenticity. But as it comes to uh, these types of hadith, the scholar's methodology regarding them is that even if they're not 100% authentic, we implement them anyway. Why? 
Because if a surah tells you the virtue of Surah Al-Mulk, a uh, hadith tells you the virtue of Surah Al-Mulk, and that hadith is not authentic, is reciting Surah Al-Mulk still a virtue? Yeah. So, it doesn't hurt to recite it. And if it earns us this virtue by reciting it every night, that's great. If it does not, reciting Surah Al-Mulk in and of itself is a good deed. It's from Islam, it's from the Sunnah, it's not a bit of course. And, you know, if we didn't get that specific virtue, we still got the Hasanat of reading, which are immense, right? They're, these are not... Uh, a small amount of hasanat So there's a number of hadith I kind of uh, skipped out on most of them Just for the sake of brevity And they're all kind of the same points Sorry, just a second here So there's a number of ahadith about the virtues of Surah Al-Mulk. One of them is gathered here where the Prophet ﷺ is reported to have said, Inna suratun, inna suratan fil Qur'ani thalathina ayah shafa'at li sahibiha hatta ghufira lah tabarak alladhi biyadihi al-mulk. There is a surah within the Qur'an. It is 30 verses long. And it, is, it, it will intercede on behalf of the one who recites it regularly. Until he is forgiven. And that surah is Tabarak Alladhi Biyadihi Al Mulk. Blessed be he in whose hands is all the dominion. Surat Al Mulk. And so it's an, inter it's an intercessor. It will intercede for the Muslim on the Day of Judgment. In what form, what will that look like? We don't know. But it will come to intercede on behalf of the person who recites it. So they will come to Allah, it will come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as they stand before him and it will say, Forgive this person, accept their actions. And then another hadith tells us that. And this is narration from Mas'ud, called Ibn Mas'ud, here al mani'a min adab al qabr. It is the one that it is the thing that prevents the punishment of the grave. So it prevents specifically punishment of the grave. There's many other hadith to that effect that say what the Prophet directly said, this is al mani'a. Al mani'a means the shield, the protection. From what specifically? From punishment of the grave. In one hadith, in one hadith, Ibn Abbas is giving advice to a man and he tells him, Go memorize this surah. Teach it to your children at home. Teach it to your wife. Teach it to your neighbors. Teach it to every Muslim you can reach. And make sure that you're reciting it every single night. Because it is Al-Mani'ah, the protector, and Al-Munajiyah, the savior, the salvation. It's a very special surah. And I heard the Prophet ﷺ say, I wish every single person had this surah in their heart. So this is a hadith from Ibn Abbas, where he's saying, I heard the Prophet ﷺ say that he wishes every single Muslim, or every single person rather, would have the surah in their heart, meaning they memorize it and they understand it. It's a special surah. It has a very special status. In another hadith, we are told that a man came to the Prophet Wasallam and he told him, I set up my tent somewhere in the middle of nowhere. And it turned out that it was over a grave that I didn't see. You know, they didn't have any tombstones or like crypts or whatever, so it was like a patch of ground. Turns out this is a grave. And he said part of it, it was exposed and I heard Surah Al-Mulk being recited inside of it. There was a man inside reciting Surah Al-Mulk until the end of it. And, and so, so he comes and tells the Prophet the story and the Prophet told him, it is the salvation, it is saving him from the punishment of a grave. When the punishment comes to him at, from his feet, it comes and it says there's no entrance from here. مَا مِنْ قِبْلِ madkhal. You can't come to him from here. He earned punishment, he committed sins. You can't hurt him from here, not his feet. Then, they, then the punishment comes to his arms, right? The angels come for, to, talk, to punish him from there because he, he committed sins in his life. The, the surah comes in a form and it stops the punishment from this angle and says no. And then so, same thing from his head and from all around. So it is like a surrounding prevention, you know, a, a preventative security from the punishment of the grave that the person would have other, otherwise been rightfully due for their sins. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us of our shortcomings and our sins and protect us from punishment of the grave and punishment in the hereafter. Allahumma ameen. And there's many other hadith to that effect. Like I said, I kept it short for the sake of brevity, but you can look them up inshallah and uh, see the virtues are all similar. Moving on to the next slide now, we're actually beginning with the surah. So it begins with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, like every surah besides Surah At-Tawbah. And Allah subhanahu wa says, Tabarak alladhi biyadihi al-mulk wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir. Inshallah, we won't be Move it up. Inshallah, we won't be able to uh, do this next week, but inshallah, we'll continue the surah the week after, on the 12th, and we'll try to finish the whole surah if possible. And so that gives us about three weeks, which is better than two. So I want everyone here to try to memorize it. 
and try your best. If you can't memorize it in its entirety, as much as you can. If you can't memorize anything, try to make sure that you recite it from 1 to 30 with perfect recitation from the Mus'haf. And don't worry, there will be no tests. So if you don't do it, don't like, <laughs> I don't want to come next week and there's no one here because you didn't memorize it, but, or the week after. But do it for you, right? Try to memorize it. At the very least, memorize a good chunk of it. If not, then know how to recite it from 1 to 30 perfectly without needing help so that you can recite it you know, uh, every single night, inshallah. And it begins, تَبَارَكَ الَّذِي بِيَدِهِ الْمُلْكُ وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ Blessed is the one in whose hands rests all authority and he is the most capable over everything. So the English translation, you always take it with a pinch of salt because it's made to be read, has to be readable. Can't have like, you know, so many explanations in between. You've seen some of those that try that. It's not very easy on the eyes. But at the same time, it doesn't gather the full meaning until we do this. And even then, this is a simplified tafsir. So the full tafsir of a surah you get when you are studying it consistently. So if there's any surah in particular that you like or that resonates with you amongst the whole Qur'an, constantly study this tafsir. You finish it from this speaker, move on to the next one. You finish from that one, start reading on it. Because that is the only time in which you will gain much virtue from a surah. Simplified tafsir like this, as a disclaimer, that you will gain virtue, they will gain, you will gain understanding, you will benefit, but it's not the full picture. So tabarak, why am I saying that? Because tabarak doesn't mean, really mean blessed. Right? That's not a very good... Uh, uh, translation but tabarak as the scholars have said they said it is similar to ta'adama or ta'ala we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what does ta'ala mean the most high right he is exalted he is higher than everything higher than every authority higher than every shortcoming and so on and so forth so tabarak is a similar meaning and some scholars said it comes from the word baraka so tabarak is a verb that means he is the source of all baraka all good all increase, that is what barakah is. An increase that is above normal. So he is the source of it. He is the source of all good and he is the one who bestows it upon others. بِيَدِهِ mulk. In his hand is all mulk. Mulk is dominion, is sovereignty, is kingdom, is ownership. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say directly he owns everything. He said he owns the dominion itself. He owns ownership. Everything that can be owned, he owns it. He owns ownership as a concept. And this is very, very important to understand. Sounds redundant when you say in English, but in reality what it means is that anybody who owns anything in this world, me with, forget the clothes that I put, my own body, that ownership is temporary and not complete. First of all, it's not complete, meaning it's, I only have it, I can only choose to do this because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me the ability to. These aren't my nails. I say that, right? My hair, my nails, my eyes. But in reality, they belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which is why when one of us dies, or some calamity, may Allah protect all of us, we say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilahi raja'un. Inna lillahi means we belong to Allah. We are from Him. We're His property. Right? We extend from Him. He can do with us as He so pleases. So in His hand is all dominion, all ownership, meaning anything that we happen to own, forget about countries and leadership, just from down to our own very bodies is one not complete ownership. We were, we, were given to, we were given it by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was given to us from Allah. And He can take it away at any time. Something that you own can't be taken away from you, shouldn't be taken away from you at any time, right? Because you own it. You choose where it goes and when. And subhanAllah, that opens your eyes to how little do you actually own in this dunya. You buy your house, you own it. God forbid some calamity comes, government can seize it, can't they? You owe debts or things. So even things that you own, may Allah protect us, can be taken from you in an instance. There is no real ownership in this dunya. In fact, when you die, that instant, everything changes. There's nothing that remains your property. And uh, subhanAllah, even your own body, right? They don't say, bring Muhammad. They say, bring the body. Right? So even you even lose your name. So these, this ayah, the point of it is, is, is to wake us up to this fact. True ownership is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the only true owner of everything that exists. Every other ownership is not complete and then it's temporary. So even while you have it, you don't call the shots and then one day it will be taken from you and returned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's reminding us that all dominion, all, all sovereignty and all power belong to him and he is able over all things. He can do whatever he wills, whatever he pleases. None can contest him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Next slide, verse number two now. 
He is the one who created life and death, or death and life, rather. It starts with death here. الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْغَفُورُ The one who created death and life in order to test which of you is best in deeds, and he is the Almighty, the All-Forgiving. Why did he start with death? الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ The one who created death and life. We usually say the opposite, right? Life and death. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying the one who created death and life. What do you think? Right answer gets uh, a water bottle. Minus one sip. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Why? Okay. It's good to be honest. You're on the right track. So life is a preparation for death. But it's like you said, some scholars said, because that is the point Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to wake up to. So very good, uh, especially for a guest. I mean, that means your mind's working, inshallah. So may Allah bless you. Uh, death is coming. It is the matter at hand. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started with it, to bring your attention to it. So it is the matter at hand right now, right? So he wanted us to know, it's as if it is a emphasis on the point at hand, which is you're going to die and be resurrected and then be held accountable. This is part of the themes of the surah, right? Anything else? Do you want the water bottle? Or? No, you're good? <laughs> I took a sip from it. Any other guesses or ideas? Why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begin with death before life? So that's one thing that the scholars suggested. Maybe it is a wake-up call to the matter at hand. Yeah? Okay, so that's what your brother said, similar, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to know that this is the matter at hand. You're going to die and you're going to be held accountable. Death is a reality and death is something you should be uh, mindful of. So that's kind of the same point, you're right. And one thing the scholars have mentioned is that death became, came before life. Were you alive first or did, were you dead first? So if you take, you know, some people say, what does that mean, right? I have to be alive to die. Death and mouth, it can be, it's often used to describe al-adam. Non-existence. It's not always used to uh, describe physical death, like a body that deteriorated, a plant that died. No, sometimes it's just used to describe non-existence. And even in English, right? We use, um, we use that word to describe things that are no longer occurring, right? Um, if you could think of uh, any example. Sometimes say like a dead joke, right? That's a dead joke, meaning... What does that mean when you say it's a dead joke? Sometimes when you say the punchline first, right? You already said the punchline, and then you kind of say the question, like, oh man, I killed the joke. So that's, in the, you know, that's the first thing that came to mind. It's a metaphorical use of the word death, which means non-existence. So did we exist first, or were we non-existent first? We, were not, we didn't exist, right? Allah created our souls, and then later He created our bodies, and then He paired them together. Then they will die and separate, then they will pair again, and then the body will be resurrected, and we will... Uh, go to our final abode. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it al Jannah, Allahumma ameen. But basically, we, at, one, at some point, we did not exist. We were non existent, so we were dead. So he started with that which came first. Another ayah that's similar is like uh, where, they, where they're calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they say, Amattana thnataini wa ahaytana thnataini. You caused us to be dead twice and brought us to life twice. So the first time we were dead is when we didn't exist, and the second time is when we physically died, and then we, the first time that we were brought to life is when we were born, and then the second time that He will bring us to life is when the hereafter, right, in the Day of Judgment. So when they're calling upon Allah, they say, you caused us not to live twice, and then to live twice. So you have all uh, gratitude and obedience. So He created death and life in order to test you. لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا What is the purpose of life? The Muslim never answers, asks that question. But he spends his whole life trying to get the best answer. Never ask that question because he knows upon learning that this is the purpose. So the purpose of life, the answer is simple for us Muslims. To test us. It is a test. It is a testing ground. It is an opportunity for us to prove ourselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created life and death, death and life, so that he can test you, so it can be apparent which one of you are best indeed. He said, Ahsanu amala. And not ekthar amala, the best in actions and not the most in actions. 
right? The best, the most sincere, the most pure. And the scholars have a number of opinions on what it means, Ahsanu Amla. Some of them said that it means Atamukum Akla. The, mo- the ones amongst you who are the most sound in mind, sound in reason. Meaning when they seen the truth, they accepted it. They didn't learn good things and then do the opposite. They didn't learn bad things, then do them anyway. They had the most sound intellect. Another uh, narration says that it means the most agile and rushed when it comes to obeying Allah. What, is it, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want to see? What is a successful test? Someone who passes the test? Someone who when he learns something is, or he or she learns something is an obligation or pleases Allah, they rush towards it. And when they learn something is forbidden, if this pleases Allah, they rush away. This is the tafsir of Ahsan al according to some scholars. And all these meanings, they go into each other. When you look at the different tafsir of Ahsan al they're all kind of similar. The quickest to obey Allah, the most sincere, the ones with the greatest deeds, and so on and so forth. So it is a test to see which, is of, which of us performs the most sincere actions. وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْغَفُورُ And he is the Al-Aziz, the most mighty, Al-Ghafur, the most forgiving. The names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end of every verse are not random. They weren't there just to close the A or make it rhyme. The names are always directly related to the message of the verse itself or the surah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He created death and life so He can test you which of you is the best of deeds and He is the most mighty and the most forgiven. What is the connection between might and forgiveness and what we just said? Okay, excellent, great job. So, he needs, you need might to create something as huge and, and as life and death. These are huge creations. So the might is an indication that this was something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to do. He's the most mighty, it wasn't difficult. It wasn't like a huge task. He's able to do it, it was not difficult at all. He's Al-Aziz. Another meaning is also that he will punish those who don't act accordingly. The might and the greatness is, a, is also a warning. In addition to this... Uh, notifying us that he's able to create the heavens and the earth and do all of this because he is the most mighty. And then on top of that is that those who don't act accordingly, who don't pass the test, they have to face Al-Aziz. That's not something that's light, right? This is Al-Aziz, the greatest. And for those who did not perform accordingly, who also fall short, but the difference is that they repent, they feel bad, they hear all of this and they say, okay, I don't want to be on that other side, he is the most forgiven. He wanted them to know that if all of this applies to you, if you're scared, if you're worried, if what's the descriptions, the hellfire and everything we're about to get into, if all of that scares you and you're worried about it and you feel like, oh no, I did some of this, don't worry. He's also al ghafur He will forgive you if you turn over a new leaf. So it's directly connected to what he just described, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Next slide, looking at verse number three. الَّذِي خَلَقَ سَبْعَ سَمَاوَاتٍ طِبَاقًا مَا تَرَى فِي خَلْقِ الرَّحْمَانِ مِن تفاوت فَرْجِعَ الْبَصَرَ هَلْ تَرَى مِنْ فُطُورِ And verse number 4 ثُمَّ ارْجِعَ الْبَصَرَ كَرَّتَيْنِ يَنْقَلِبِ إِلَيْكَ الْبَصَرُ خَاسِئًا وَهُوَ حَسِيرٌ He is the one who created seven heavens, one above the other in levels. You will never see any imperfection in the creation of the most compassionate. So look again. Do you see any flaws? Then look again and again. Repeat that. Look, your sight will return frustrated and weary. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying now, you want to know he is Al-Aziz? Go outside. Look in the sky. Just right now, but the brother was asking me, am I looking for the moon for, for Muharram? I was just looking at the clouds. There, you seen the colors outside? Especially after the rain and stuff. There's, there's a multitude of colors. And subhanAllah, you know, we, in New York we don't see this much sky. So I was able to turn, <laughs> you know, 180 degrees and see that there's more sky that I never knew existed, right? And it's still dark gray here. But on this other side, it looks like a canvas. You just look at that and you say, SubhanAllah, it's not something that is just, okay, whatever. I gotta, you know, check my phone. It's something that you are looking at and you're odd if you're paying attention. If you just looked at it for a little bit and considered its size, its color, the textures, the designs, the seamless nature in which it exists, there's no way that there's any other possible conclusion besides what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, which is you'll be odd and you'll be humbled. And your vision will be frustrated if you're looking for a flaw. Saying those who are looking for a flaw, keep looking. Let me know when you get one. 
If you're looking for a crack, if you're looking for a glitch, you're looking for some, you know, haze where like, oh wait, the, the, you know, the simulation isn't complete or whatever, you're not going to find it. Keep looking, you will be humbled, you will be frustrated, your eyes will glow, grow bleary and tired. يَنْقَلِبِ إِلَيْكَ الْبَصَرُ خَاسِئًا وَهُوَ حَسِيرٌ خَاسِئًا means مُبَعَدًا Your eyesight will be very distant, like you looked really far. You looked all around. That, that, it's used to, to, to give the image that you looked all around and you're so tired of looking because there is no discrepancy. Consider this now, us over a millennium and a half later almost, where we can't just look at the sky. You've seen that new picture from the James Webb telescope of all the galaxies now even more out there. So we have the opportunity, Allah blessed us with technology which allows you to see even more. Some people are still not humbled. Some people are still not in awe. Some people are still looking for the end of it all, right? Trying to find a flaw or some kind of indication that will reveal to them the ultimate truth. The understanding of everything or whatever they're looking for. But they'll never find it, right? This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them, you will not find it. And a lot of people, they think that if you look into these things, you look into science, it causes you to get further from the deen, but not at all. If you have a basic understanding of Islam, and you, and you, uh, you, know, you know your pillars of faith, your pillars of Islam, science only increases you in faith. And I remember one teacher was saying that maybe one hour of Nat Geo, you sit down and watch a National Geographic uh, documentary, it may do better for you than a whole bayan or a whole lecture in some, in some cases, right? Maybe in some state you're not, you know, um, fully, uh, you're not in a state in which you'll accept this information, right? You're not ready to take notes, your mind's not upstairs, you know, and you're, 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 you're stressed out, you're coming from work, whatever it may be. But it's easier to just watch, like, you know, Blue Planet or whatever it's called, Blue Planet, right? So you sit down and, and that's easier for you. And it'll still increase you in faith when you see the intricate nature in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created everything. And it'll increase you in humility. Uh... The famous scientist, I forgot his name, maybe Heisenberg, is his name Heisenberg, Werner? Werner Heisenberg, is that it? Hmm? I, okay, so maybe I have the wrong name. Maybe it's not that guy. Oh, no, no, it's Werner Heisenberg. Yeah, so it is the guy with the uncertainty principle. So he said that the first sip of science, the first sip of the cup of science, will make you an atheist. If you just start studying science, you say, oh, there is no God. I can see all of it in front of me. I know exactly how it works. But at the end of the glass, God is waiting for you. Meaning after he's, go, going, he's, 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 you know, he's a huge scientist, right? I think in the 30s or 20s or whatever. And he said after ex extensive study of science, there's no way this just happened. That's his conclusion. Right? And people argue, did they believe in the religious God? Or is he talking about the... Well, it doesn't matter. The point of what we're saying here is that he acknowledges after looking all around him and studying how it works, that's all he did, right? He didn't go to any halaqa, he didn't read the Quran. He concluded that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us here, if you look into the heavens, if you peer into the creation in general and ponder, you will come back humbled and in awe of the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Verse number five, and we'll, we'll wrap it up inshallah in the next, uh, by 9.30 or so. I'm trying to get to 15, so bismillah. And indeed, وَلَقَدْ زَيَّنَّ السَّمَاءَ الدُّنْيَا بِمَصَابِيحِ And indeed we have adorned the lowest heaven with stars like lamps. What am I doing wrong? Like this? Okay. We have adorned the lowest heaven with stars like lamps and made them as missiles. وَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ رُجُومًا لِلشَّيَاطِينَ For the uh, devils. And we have prepared for them a torment of the blaze. So, there's a hadith where the Prophet tells us the explanation of this ayah that before his advent as a prophet, before revelation began, the shayateen used to have a method in which they used to try to spy on the heavens. So it's described to us in the hadith as they used to, you know, make like a stare. Is this something that, you know, now that we know that the heavens extend past space, it's not something that you can exactly envision, but it doesn't matter. Because the point is, we don't see jinn. We don't know how they function. We don't know what they look like. So the Prophet ﷺ was just bringing the meaning close to us. And he says that they used to eavesdrop in this fashion, whatever fashion which they reach, wherever they used to reach. Right? We don't know the exact distances, but in this fashion, they used to overhear the angels discussing the decree that Allah ﷻ sent down. 
So another hadith now, we have that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down the decree and the angels hear it and receive it. And then they implement it as the servants of Allah. So we have the angels of the mountains, the angels of weather, the ones who take the soul, the one who provide the risk and so on and so forth. And they used to catch a little bit of the decree that Allah made. So Allah sends down a decree that so and so will be born today and so and so will make a million dollars and, and such. And they hear a little bit of it, whatever they can catch before the angels cast them out. And they relay that to human beings. So they go to a human being and they share with him that information. That information tells people, hey, I know that you are going to be a doctor. So the person goes like, wow, tell me more. Right here, take my palm or whatever they do, right? Is that how palm readings work? I don't know. <laughs> I got to, you know, save face. But um, then that person, what's the goal of all this? That the shaitan will take that true thing and use it to misguide the person. Because if I told you, hey, I know that your name begins with an M, you'll be like, how do you know? You know, I just met you. You won't think of the fact that like, that's like probably like 30% of people, but you're automatically intrigued. So if they're able to share a true fact with these people, then they can mix in the nonsense and the misguidance with the ultimate goal being what? Kufr and shirk, to pull them away. So with the advent of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, now that revelation began with the Qur'an's revelation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prevented the shayateen from ever doing that again. So this is in the period of guidance, misguidance comes, new revelation, new guidance, and that keeps going. Now that this is the final guidance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prevented the shayateen from this method of misguidance, even though they have many more, this one has been sealed off. So the revelation is pristine, it will never be uh, corrupted through this door. So that is done through them being cast out with blazing fire in the heavens. Is it meteors? Is it comets? We don't know exactly. These are the things that we see streaking across the sky. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referencing. It could be these things specifically or other creations as scholars have mentioned that are specifically streaking across the sky to cast out these devils perhaps. But here it is mentioned and uh, the, the, the stars are mentioned specifically. The next verse, six, verse number 6 says, Those who disbelieve in their Lord will suffer the punishment of hell and what an evil destination. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and our families and all Muslims. Allahumma ameen. The next verse, number 7, When they are tossed into it, they hear its roaring, its shahiq, as it boils over. Shahiq is mentioned a number of times in the Quran and some scholars said it is, it was, it is the sound of, of, of it's similar to the brain of a donkey. And others said it was used to describe people when they are extremely angry or extremely sorrowful. You know when they can't grasp breath, like you know when they're so angry and it gets stuck in their throat, that is Shahiq. So it's not a pleasant sound, quite obviously, that when they're so enraged or so sorrowful and they're yelling or they're crying, the sound of the air when it gets stuck, you know when you go and like, or... Uh, sharp intake that gets stuck and it sounds kind of like a snort. So this is the shahiq. It is a sound of rage. It is loud, uh, but uh, sorry, it could be it could be a roar, or it could be this sound that I just described, which is a sound a raging sound or a sorrowful sound. And of course, the the, the hellfire would have its own version of this. May Allah subhanahu wa taala never allow us to hear it. Allahumma amin. Allah subhanahu wa taala says about the righteous people, لا يسمعون حسيسها. They don't hear it. They don't hear what's going on on this side. They're prevented from it because even its sound is a punishment. Even its sound is something terrifying and unpleasant. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us, our families and all Muslims. So when they are tossed into it, they hear its shahiq as it boils over. The other verse in uh, Surah Al-Furqan, which is similar, gives us a little more insight to the this experience or this uh, aspect of the hellfire may Allah protect all of us. No, that, that's taghayyudhan wa hiya tafur. So it's not Surah Al Furqan. It's your homework now to look up which Surah it is. <laughs> Where Shahiq is being mentioned. You're right. It does say. No, but that, that says taghayyud, not, not shahiq. So uh, it's, I think it's a similar word. That's, what, that's what's being referenced here. Zeklachim. I don't read my own notes. <laughs> but that's why I have them up there for you guys to, to pick up what I... It's, it's a test to see if you're paying attention. <laughs> that's the classic, right? When the teacher makes a mistake, he says, hey, it's a test to see if you're... 
So um, I believe it says here it's in Surah Hud. So we'll, we, you can see there for more context about this sound called the Shahiq. So moving on. Verse number 8 now. تَكَادُ تَمَيَّزُ مِنَ الْغَيْظِ كُلَّمَا أُلْقِيَ فِيهَا فَوْجٌ سَأَلَامُ خَزَنَتُهَا أَلَمْ يَأْتِكُمْ نَذِيرٌ It almost bursts in fury. Every time a group is cast into it, its keepers will ask them, did a warner not come to you? So, it almost bursts in fury. The, the hellfire is so severe, so hot. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls it another surah and surah, At-Takathur, Al-Humaza, Al-Hutama, that which grinds, hot. Is Tahtim is grinding and breaking things into several pieces. So it's a, it's a crushing machine. And it is so severe in its heat. Many a hadith that tells us the extent. It's a very terrifying image. It's something that is described as a, almost as a living thing, as a beast, as a creature that crushes and devours. May Allah protect all of us. Here it's saying it's almost bursting in its fury. Another hadith the Prophet said that the hellfire complained to Allah and said to him, part of me is devouring the rest. It's burning itself, it's consuming itself. So he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, allowed it two breaths. It breathes. It has an intake and it has an outtake. It breathes in and it breathes out. It inhales and it exhales. And he said from this process, we get the most extreme weather. That the extreme heat is it exhaling. And the extreme cold is it inhaling. So this isn't a breathing process like lungs and... That's not, don't, you know, if you're picturing that, it's the wrong image. What you need to understand is that it's such a severe creature. This is what, Allah, this is what the, the hadith is trying to get us to understand. This is the message that we are meant to receive. Not to understand exactly the how, because we can't understand that. And may Allah never allow us to see it. And Allahumma ameen. But the point is to realize that it is a great issue. It's a great threat. It's not something we should take lightly. It's not something we should say, oh, you know, may Allah save me, Allah forgive me, and that's that. It's something that we should keep on our mind and be fearful of. So it, it was allowed these two breaths to stop itself from consuming itself. Every time a group is cast into it, the people are resurrected and judged in nations. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, al al You are the last, al Wasallam, you are the last of people and the first on the day of judgment to be judged. This ummah, from the honoring of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as an honor to him, his ummah will be taken first. And they will be the majority of the inhabitants of, the, of, of, of Jannah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us a huge blessing. And here it's mentioned that when one group is cast in, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us, its keepers will ask them, a prophet never came to you? You never received revelation? And this is not su'al istifham. Su'al istifham is a question you want to know the answer to. This is called su'al tawbikh. A question that is meant to embarrass, rebuke. It is a humiliation. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want to know the answer. He knows. The angels as well, they know. Of course a warner was sent to them. There is no nation except they had a warner. Someone came to them. Something came to them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, We were not going to punish any people until they had a prophet sent to them, a messenger sent to them, clarifying, explaining, making sure that they are perfectly equipped to pass this test for which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them. So they're asking as a rebuke because they know the answer as it comes in the next verse, verse number 9. Which is قَالُوا بَلَى قَدْ جَاءَنَا نَذِيرٌ فَكَذَّبْنَا وَقُلْنَا مَا نَزَلَ اللَّهُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا فِي ضَلَالٍ كَبِيرٍ They said, definitely, you're right, a warner did come for sure. No one's denying it here. But, instead we denied him and said, Allah has revealed nothing. You are in extreme misguidance. You're talking, Mama John. We don't know where you're, you know, we told him, we don't know what you're talking about. You're crazy. You're a magician. You're a fortune teller. You're telling stories. All these things that we have that they responded to the prophets with. They will admit, this is what we said and what we said and what we responded to instead of saying, we recognize your mission and who you come from. And they will lament and say, if only we had listened and reasoned and thought about it, we would not be among the residents of the hellfire. You have so many people in this world, they say, I'm smarter than that. I just had one brother, we were discussing like the, his boss, he, Invited him out and they, he wanted him to drink with him. And he told him, why don't you drink? And he said, you know, because I'm Muslim. And he says, what will happen if you drink? This thunderbolt going to come and, and shoot you down. If you can't see it, if you can't hear it, it's not real. This is what he said. He's like, you know, I don't only believe things I can hear and see. 
and understand. And this stuff is all mumbo jumbo. People are drinking left and right. Everyone seems fine. There's no like you know pillar of flame coming to devour them or, or anything. So this person or these kind of people, they are so attached to what they hear and see and understand as if that is the ultimate rubric for what's true. Can your ears be tricked? Can your eyes be tricked? Can your intellect be tricked? Happens every single day, right? And it's not a deficiency on your part that you're foolish, you're not paying attention. It's human nature. Our eyes and our ears and our understanding is very, very limited to the here and now. It's very, very limited to our previous experiences and biases. It's very limited to what people just told us a few minutes ago, right? If, if before I came here and sat, someone said, yo, this is a huge sheikh and like, you know, he's uh, traveled the world and you'd... None of that is true. <laughs> But someone said all that and they weren't joking, they were serious and they, you, you'd come in here with a completely different um, attitude than if you said who's giving the talk to them and they said they just chose somebody. They just found him, which is closer to the truth <laughs> than the first one. But if someone told you that, you'd come in with a completely built bias around that, right? Even if... You didn't know anything about me, you just automatically have a background emotion and feeling and approach to everything that, I'm, that I was about to say, in either, either for better or for worse. And then if you, uh, if you found out other information later, it would all begin to clash and then you'd become confused, so on and so forth. Right? We, this is something that we've all experienced right? in, in, in different shape or form and to varying degrees of severity. Sometimes it's all a funny misunderstanding or mishap and sometimes it is more severe. But the point is, that's how easy it is. So if people who are all about the here and now, what I see, hear and understand is the ultimate uh, paradigm and rubric, these are people who are worshipping themselves. They're people who have taken themselves as a god. Whether they know it or not, or whether they acknowledge it or not, this is the reality because it's only about here and now, what I feel, what I see, what I understand. As if they're the you know, most perceptive and the most sound in health. and they, Everyone acknowledges that they have deficiency, but then the contradiction is how they respond to these things. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, they themselves will acknowledge couldn't hear nothing, we couldn't see anything, we, didn't, we were fools. We were, all, we were like stones. Another uh, verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likens them to the animals and then he says, rather they are even more misguided. Because right? the animals don't have what we have. They're not tasked with what we are tasked with. So if we don't own up to it, if we don't step up to the plate, if we don't bear this responsibility better, if we don't you know, uh, push ourselves harder, then we are more to blame then we are more blameworthy than animals in this case as, as human beings in general which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying in, in that verse in Surah Al-Araf but here he's saying these same people who acknowledge themselves our hearing and our sight and our mind availed us nothing we were fools, we were blind, we were deaf, we were dumb فَاعْتَرَفُوا بِذَنْبِهِمْ فَسُحْقًا لِأَصْحَابِ السَّعِيرِ the last two verses now 11 and 12 so they will confess their sin so away with the residents of the hellfire they will confess their sin, it was given in singular, فَاعْتَرَفُوا بِذَنْبِهِمْ instead of ذُنُوبِهِمْ It's given in the singular, some scholars said that is just uh, a, a, a one sin representative of all of them. So we acknowledge our sin, meaning all of our sins, us sinning, the act of us sinning. And some said this is, they're acknowledging the ultimate sin, which is kufr and shirk, which led them to everything else. So by acknowledging the greatest and uh, recognizing it, they're recognizing all the others thereafter. May Allah protect us. And then finally, because it's important to have that balance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, kabir." Indeed, those who are in awe of their Lord without seeing Him will have forgiveness and a mighty reward. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of His justice and His compassion and mercy, is that there's never an instance of punishment mentioned without an instance of reward right after or right before. Jannah, there has to be nar before or after it. Almost always, 99.9% .9 of the time. The anger of Allah, then you'll have His pleasure because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want us to despair. He wants us to know there has to be a balance. He's angry with people who do this, but He also forgives all sins. These people will be the people of the hellfire. They had no intellect, they had no understanding, but there was a group who feared Allah despite never seeing Him, they will have their reward. And so on and so forth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, رَبَّهُمْ They have khashya of their Lord. Khashya, here it's translated uh, in awe of their Lord. Sometimes it's described as fearing their Lord. But khashya is a little bit more than that. Because fear is khawf. So what is khashya? Anyone know? What is special about khashya? What makes it a special kind of fear? What does it have that other things don't? The other fear doesn't? Khawf. Close. Respect is a good one. Kind of fits as well. But khashya is fear plus... 
Take another shot. Hmm? No? That's similar to respect. Before you can respect someone, you need to know them. Yeah, you need to understand. No. So, khashiyah is fear with, no, with knowledge. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah min ibadihi al ulama. Who has khashiyah of Allah? The scholars. They know Him. Everyone else, they could have fear. But that khashiyah only comes when you increase in knowledge. It's not exclusive to the scholars, but the more closer you are to scholarly nature, to academically scholarly nature and understanding the Qur'an and the hadith, the more closer you are to fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a higher level. So they feared Allah with knowledge. They knew who He was. Bilghaybi, without seeing Him. Remember, the people before, what did they say? If we could hear, see, or understand, we wouldn't have been here. And the people who are being praised here, they feared Allah without seeing Him. Because they recognize that's not the end all be all. There's so much that we don't see and don't hear. So I'm not connected to that. That's not the end all be all for me. I know that there's so much that humans don't see, don't understand, and don't hear. So to me, it's not illogical or far fetched to fear or believe in something I don't see. Because I can see endless effects of it everywhere around me. The creation, which is what Allah began with. The purpose of life, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began with. All these things help me see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A man was asked, do you see Allah? You know, someone was asking, do you see Allah? Allah's, okay, okay. And he said, yes, I do, actually. So the, the guy asked him, was surprised, how? Then he says, every single time I sin and people don't know about it. I see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every single time that I made a dua and he was there. It was answered. Everything, every single time I had a need and it was fulfilled, I saw him. So the, the, the righteous, they see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the time. Not physically, but in the effects of everything around them in their existence. They will have forgiveness and a mighty reward. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says the people who do evil will be punished. The people who do good will be, should be rewarded, right? And, but He began with the forgiveness, the scholars say, because He just finished describing the hellfire in great detail, fearful detail. It's as if He is comforting and consoling the believers. Whatever you did wrong that falls into the same category as these people, that will be forgiven. Don't worry. You will be forgiven for that and you will not be subject to any of this. And then on top of that, you'll have a great reward. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to write that for us and decree for us that we'll have a share of that. We will stop at verse number 12. And inshallah, try to cover the next 18. Some of it is repetitive, so it'll be easier inshallah in two weeks. Um, go home, recite Surah Al-Mulk. Try to recite it every single night. If it seems a bit long, start a bit by bit. Five verses every night. Like Salam Farkat. Then maybe after you could consistent for a week, add another five. You're consistent for a week on that, add another five until you're doing all 30. Maybe read it with your family. You have a four member household, everyone reads 30 divided by four, whatever that is, right? It's gonna be like seven point something. Everyone reads that many verses and then you move on. Uh, you, if, it's, if all that doesn't work, listen to it nightly. It takes about, I think, like quick reciters, like four or five minutes to hear all of it. So all these options, but don't let it pass you by. Surah Al Mulk is a treasure, it's a gem. And it's something that we should have a special connection with amongst the rest of the Qur'an as the Prophet Sallallahu taught us and his companions taught us thereafter. And uh, try to memorize it, inshallah, by our next meeting. Uh, so that is something that you are continuously benefiting from. Read the translation that will make it easier to memorize as well. Are there any questions, comments, feedback? Everybody's happy? Yes. Yeah, 
No, that, that's excellent points. First off, with the hellfire, so when you read descriptions like that, it helps, you know, increase your your uh, your fear and your your wariness of it. So when you hear that the least person who's punished is punished in such a, you know, um, in such a way, and they think that their punishment is the most severe, there's another hadith that tells us that as well. It puts, it, you know, helps keep you in check, and you should always alternate between reading descriptions of the hellfire, descriptions of Jannah, mercy of, of Allah, the punishment of Allah. Always balance. Don't just focus on one without the other. And, uh, and some scholars had you know, also mentioned a good uh, methodology of looking at it. If you're tempted by a sin, think of the punishment. If you're and if you're b feeling lazy towards... Uh, sorry, if you're tempted by a sin to perform it now, then you think of the punishment of Allah. Read the descriptions of the hellfire. Worry. Don't do it. And if you already committed a sin and you're thinking of something that you committed, then you think about the punishment, uh, think about the reward and the forgiveness and, and, and the, the mercy of Allah. And... Uh, and use your, these emotions and this knowledge to balance. So, so that's very useful. And the second point, I, I believe that the quote was, do you have a mind? Right? Because the difference with the brain is that we can see the brain. I can see your brain right? with machinery and stuff. So they, they, from, if I remember correctly, and it could be more than one person, but just like you said, someone said, can you see a mind? You see the brain, but the mind itself is what thinks, what gives consciousness. There's plenty of things that have a brain, but not a mind. In fact, we don't know of any other uh, creature, a living thing that has consciousness the way we do. That's what, so you can't see that. You want to say it's er electrical impulses? Well, you can see electrical impulses in their brain of frogs and tadpoles and whatever. Why don't they have a conscience and science and all this other stuff? So like, that's a very good point. That not everything that is, uh, that is real or that exists is visible. So, so that's a good point. Do you, you know, by, by I just wanted to correct it, I think it's a mind, not a brain. Because a brain you can't see. Right, you could... See it through several ways of why the person is still alive. Zakla Khayan, those are good points. So, inshallah, if uh, anybody wants the PowerPoint, you can, uh, we can send it to you guys, I don't mind. And uh, inshallah, we'll continue next week. Yes, sir. Yeah. Right. It's a very good question. Excellent question. So it is, uh, it is mentioned in, more, in most narrations that I came across, which is in the night in general. So the night, Islamically speaking, begins from Maghrib and is all the way up till Fajr. So any time in that period, generally speaking, is what I uh, understood from, from what I've read. Um, I don't think, I'm trying to remember if there's anything that mentions it before you sleep, but I, I can't recall. From, from what I know, Allah Alam is that it's just in the night in general. So it's up to you. Once the Maghrib hits, from now until you go to sleep or till Fajr, try to recite it. Yeah. Zakla Khan for the questions. Excellent question. Yes, sir. Yeah. So that's a good question as well. So there's some hadith, the majority of the hadith that I came across were not the strongest in nature. So that, that's like a just point number one, just to mention as we said in the beginning. So together, in conjunction, they make this a uh, preferable action. But individually, when you look at them, they might be weak. So with that being said, some of them do mention memorizing. And, and, and you know, uh, they, they mention like a special kind of relationship with the surah where the person is doing more than just reading it. But that they memorize it, they contemplate over it, and so on and so forth. So it's more of like an active reading. And that seems to be the bigger emphasis than, uh, sorry, the recitation seems to be the bigger emphasis than the memorization. But with that being said, some narrations do mention memorization. So there's, a, and we all know there is a merit in and of itself to memorizing any portion of the Quran. So I would recommend if you can memorize it, even if it's over a year, do it. Take a verse a day. Take a verse a day, it'll be 30 days. But let's say a verse every few days it takes you two, three months. There's no race. Like, you know, you don't have to do it as soon as possible. More importantly, recite it as often as you can every single night would be ideal. That's like, definitely do that because that'll take you like, you know, 10 minutes max to listen to it even less. If you're listening and following with the Mus'haf, it'll take you very, very little time, five, six minutes. So definitely focus on that. If you can memorize it even through, over a lengthy period of time, I would definitely say go for it. There's no like, there's no lack of merit in that. Like it just wins. So I definitely recommend to do it. But the, the blessing of the reward of 
Surah Al-Mulk every night, inshallah is attainable by just reading it. Not, not, you don't have to memorize it. So, Jazakum Khan everyone. I hope it was beneficial. I hope it was enjoyable. I enjoyed your presence and your attentiveness. Jazakum Khan for answering the questions and for asking them. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He gives us the strength and the ability to memorize the surah, to understand it, to contemplate over it, and for it to be an intercessor for us in our graves and on the day that we meet Him, along with the rest of the Quran and our good deeds. Allahumma ameen. Subhanaka wa barna wa hamdik ashadu anna ilayna ant astaghfir wa tubu laik wa sallallahu wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.